Yeah, this is awesome, this, the new volumes. Um, this is done with the new volumes. Hello. All right. Um, this is just me messing around with it, but I'm, my company is Lux, and we're going to start with my new reel, and then we're going to talk about R20. Thank you. Um, yeah, loads of people involved in that, not just me. I get to work with lots of different studios, direct to client. So like companies like Buck, Kin Things, Never Sit Still, Tendril, um, many more. Visit Lux.tv and uh, the, the reel's not even there yet, but when it is, I'll put credits. Always put the credits. Um, yep, yeah, Lux.tv, there's two of those. Hello Lux.com is our training resource, which we have about 100 free tutorials for cinema. Arnold, Octane, X Particles, loads of stuff, some After Effects. We also sell professional training, and a lot of the renders that I'm going to show you are all done in Redshift. That's our renderer of choice. And we have a new product by Rich Nosworthy for sale at the moment. If you're learning Redshift, this is the one. It's awesome. Rich really knows his stuff. Uh, he's taught me a thing or two, that's for sure. And I love his work. Amazing. So. You can get that from hellolux.com. We're doing a Seagraph special at the moment, so now's the time to grab it. I'm going to be talking about Cinema 4D R20. I've been using it for, since C4D Go, which was actually a free version they gave away with Final Cut Pro version 1. So it's version 5, I think. Getting on a bit. I'm going to be talking about OpenVDB, which is, um, what is OpenVDB? Actually, there's a really interesting explanation on the uh, OpenVDB website, which says that OpenVDB is a C++ library for calculating something or other about sparse volumetric data. Or I'm like, what? What does that mean? Anyway, DreamWorks uh, kind of created it. They've won a whole bunch of Academy Awards for it. It's really clever. And the way I like to explain it is that if we think of pixels, we're each pixel that we're, um, pixels are generally square these days. I know you can get non-square. If you think of a black and white image, um, the pixel will have a value which is either black to white. And when we make a whole collection of these pixels, then we get a picture. Ta -da! And with OpenVDB and volumes, it works the same. But instead of a 2D pixel, we have a voxel. And voxels are square, cubic even. They have depth. But it's the same principle. They all have a value. And that value is, determines like what your picture looks like, but your picture is 3D. And you make that picture by rendering those voxels either as a surface or um, with a volume shader or something. So how does it work? Stanford Bunny. Wouldn't be a presentation without it. Hi, Bunny. Um, but I'll put this up just to show you that voxels are measured by the size of them. And that determines the resolution of your 3D image or your sculpt or whatever it is, your volume. So of course, the larger the voxel, the lower resolution. So you can make your voxel smaller, and you get more detail, more resolution. If you go even smaller, and you get even more detail. But of course, lots and lots of these is going to take more memory. It's going to become a little bit slower. But the, the nice thing about this approach is that you can start off kind of roughing things out with a large voxel size. And then you just make it a bit smaller to make sure. It does change a bit as you change the resolution. But just to make sure you're getting the result that you want, and then at render time, you can set that even smaller so you get a really fine detail. So it's a nice workflow. 
And this is all the nerdy bit. We'll look at some funny things in a minute. But it's worth kind of understanding how the, the different types of OpenVD work. Because I think it's like when you understand the, the, the principles behind it, it helps you understand how to use the tool. So we have two types. We have signed distance field. And signed distance field is generally used for like modeling and stuff like that. And what it does is if you add a model to it, it puts all these voxels around the edge. So we have an inner, an inner area and an external area. And each voxel, the value of the voxel, is simply the distance to the nearest point on the surface. And you can add more to the interior and exterior, which means that when you model it, you can kind of dilate or erode your models. So you can change them like this. The cool thing about sign distance field is that you can do amazing Boolean operations. And you can do it using lots of different meshes. But you can also do it with things like shaders, formulas, and splines. And you can use those to control values of your voxels. The other type that we have, and I got this gradient the wrong way around, really. It should be white to black, but you know. Um, fog. Fog is much simpler. It just has a value in the voxel of 0 to 1, and it just fills your volume with these voxels. In fact, I read somewhere that generally the whole scene is full of voxels, and it's only once they're activated that they use any memory or even considered. And because of this technique of building this kind of grid structure, it means it's really, really efficient. Generally, you use fog for rendering fog, amorphous effects, fire, smoke, clouds. And you use sign distance field for volume, uh, bleh, rendering meshes. But you can still mesh fog. Who says we have to stick to these rules? And meshing fog actually looks pretty rad. So blah, blah, let's, let's look at some stuff. It's much more interesting. One of the things you can do is you can create these kind of like fake fluid effects. I don't know if any of you use After Effects, but if you do, you probably know that what you can do is you get two shape layers or something, and if you push them together so they intersect, and then if you blur it quite a lot and then crush it with levels, you get that sort of meta ball, like, liquidy effect. We can do that in 3D with this new system. OK, so here I've got, like, some type. OK, I'm just going to hide that. I've got a matrix object which is set to generate all these matrices on the surface of that type. Um, and if I just hold down Alt, I'm going to add in a volume builder. And you see in this, me in this menu, we've got a few options. Volume mesh is a really quick way to just create a mesh from a whole bunch of selected objects. Volume loader allows you to load VDB files. If we want to create them directly, we use the volume builder. So as soon as I add that in and add my matrix objects into that volume builder, we can see all of our matrix, all of our voxels. Um, here you go. And essentially, the way that they're visualized is with these like 2D cards. They're, they're sprites almost. You can see that, but they, they orient themselves towards the camera. They look at the normals, and, they, and you get illumination as well. You can see that these voxels are pretty big. So when we come to our volume builder, we can reduce that down, let's say 2.5. And now you can see that we're getting these little spheres. So where we've added our matrix object into the volume builder, it's giving us like a little sphere around each point. So we select our matrix object in here. Each of our objects has its own bunch of parameters. And the matrix object, as you can see, has a radius. So we can change this to change the size of those radius. Um, let's set that to, say, 10. Um, the other thing we can do, of course, is use all of our effectors. So if I add a random effector to my matrix, boom, boom, boom. Oh, it's already in there. How about that for efficiency? Enable that. But one, one thing you might notice is that even though this random effector is set to randomize the scale, it's only randomizing the position. If we switch these off, whoops, not that. You can see it is, in fact, randomizing the scale of the matrices, but it's been not taken into account. That's because down here we've got this option, use particle size. If you don't check that, then it makes it a little bit quicker and more efficient because it doesn't need to load that additional MoGraph data. If we do check that, you can see that now we get these random sizes. So now we've got this sort of blobby thing. We can add in a measure, and the measure's resolution will be determined by the size of the voxel. And you can see now we've got something that we can actually render. Now, as I said before, like all of the voxels just have a simple value. And just like in, with pixels, you can blur that value. So if you've got like black and white pixels, when you blur it, you get all your grays in between. This works exactly the same. And down here, you can see we've got a smooth layer and a reshape layer. 
So the smooth layer is essentially like a blur. And there we go. And you can see that's now blurred this. So now it's feeling a bit more like fluid. And a very common usage for the way that people would use this to render fluids is they'll have, like, create a whole bunch of particles, and then they'll mesh them with OpenVDB, and then they'll dilate those particles so that they become bigger, and they all sort of blur, blur, they all blur together. And then you smooth them out, and then you dil um, erode them back again. And then you get this really nice, fine, liquid effect. I'm just going to smooth this one for now. Down here, you can see we've got different options. At the moment, it's set to Gaussian. And it really is just like a Gaussian blur, but on, on the voxels. We also have a few others in here. My favorite is Laplacian flow. Sounds very exotic. Um, I don't know what that is. But um, the difference is, is that the, the Gaussian is faster and blurrier and softer. And as you go down the list, they become much more accurate. And they become a little bit more demanding, a little bit slower. Um, so depending on how you want it to work, to show, look, if I show you, look, you can see. That, that blurs them, but the, you, the definition is much more defined. Um, so I'm going to set this voxel distance. I'll leave it at two, actually. So imagine we wanted to do like a little reveal of this. We could come to the beginning here, maybe set this radius to be seven. Uh, maybe a bit lower, five, something like that. And then just come to the end. And let's set that to be 10, 12, something. Boom. And there you go. And you can, I mean, really simple. And you can see that now we just do like a really simple kind of fluidy reveal. Really starting off with a really basic approach. But you can see it works very quickly and nice and efficient. Um, and of course, we can put on some little dodgy material that I made. And it kind of looks like honey, almost. Um, anyway, the next example is very similar, but it's a bit more detailed. And it just shows you kind of how we can use VDB with fields and stuff. It's a really cool little trick that I found. And it just shows you, really, the power of the new field system. So in this example, I've got this text. I think it originally said murder. And then I thought that was a bit scary. <laughs> so I changed it to the guilty. But I didn't change it up here. <laughs> um, anyway, so I've got this text. It's as if I was doing like a crime scene title sequence or something. And what I want to do is I want to have like liquid pool as if it's blood. And then all pool and cause the, write the word. And then a whole bunch of drips be generated procedurally as that happens. So first of all, just to create the pooling effect, we've got this. We put it in a volume builder. OK. Um, what I've got up here is a, gen, uh, a particle system. It's, the, it's a standard particle system. So if we press play, you can see we just get all these particles sort of firing across. I've added in a modifier, friction. Friction slows them down with a linear field just so that when we do this, they kind of start to gather inside the, where the type is. So if we come back to my perspective view, so what I can do now is I can literally drag my emitter into my volume builder. And you can see now we get this same kind of thing with the matrix object. It's putting this radius around each particle. It's meshed it. And you can, well, it hasn't meshed it. These are voxels. But we could mesh it. I um, mean, you see how quick that was. The problem with this is that the default particle system, it doesn't work with effectors. So I actually, I want to take that out. So what I want to do is I want to have all of these sizes different, just so that every, all this, as the liquid pools, they're all different sizes. It's be a bit more interesting. So I'm going to come down, hold Shift. Let's add in a matrix object. OK, and by default, we've got a grid array. I'm going to set that to object mode. And then I can drag my particle emitter into there. And it's the same as before. So now we're creating a matrix on each of those particles, which means we don't need to see that anymore. We can hide that. It also means with our matrix object, we can add our random effector. We can enable that. And then again, we just need to come in here and set use particle size. Of course, I don't want to see it like this. I only want to see the, the particles when they intersect with the type. And because we're using sign distance field, you can see that here as our volume type. It gives us these Boolean operations. So if I choose intersect, hide this matrix, OK, and then rewind, press play. You can see we start to get this result as the kind of the particles intersect with the extrude object. Still not feeling as fluid as we might want. But seriously, we can just do that blurry trick again. And it works. It's fine. We just add that on. Now we press play. You can see, ba 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 ba. Feels a bit more fluidy. It's nice the way they kind of get that 
merging together. Um, I think with the smoothing, I seem to have gone louder all of a sudden. And um, with the smoothing there, I'm going to just reduce the voxel size to one so it's still reasonably defined. So essentially now we have our, our fluid effect. So the next thing that I want to do with this is just create like some drips that happen. And I want the drips to be generated almost in a procedural way because I don't want any drips where there isn't any blood. It wouldn't make sense. But I don't want to go through and hand keyframe all of my drips. I want, the, I, want that, I want this mesh or whatever to drive the animation. And you can do that pretty easily with MoGraph now. So if I fold this down, in here I've got a drip spline. I'm just going to come up and just switch all these off for a moment. So I've got this drip spline. This is not exactly complicated. It's just a simple spline that just animates down. You can see it there. It could be a Mo spline, but I've just done it with point level animation. Or it could be a morph, whatever. I've used an instance here of my text spline. Let's switch that off. And that's just so that if I come back here and change my text, then obviously that's going to update in the instance, I'm trying to keep it procedural. But I need a flat surface to generate my drips on because I need, a, I need a surface with depth to use the intersect for the Boolean. But for the drips, I just need this flat surface. So here I've cloned all of those drips across that type. Because we're using MoGraph, we can easily come in here um, and adjust the number of drips if we want more or less. You know, we could place them in a more of a manual way or we could just randomly adjust the seed until we think that looks good, you know, something like that. That one looks great. Um, so now what we can do is we can come back to our volume builder. Here it is. And we can drag our cloner in there. But you notice in the previous examples what I did was I added them all as children. And you can see next to them in the list it says child. It's very handy. It tells you just in case you don't, if you can't see just below that line. Now you know it's there. Um, but the other way of doing it is you can just link them. So if I drag and drop this one in, now it says link. So that's pretty handy. So you, they don't, if, if it doesn't suit your project for it to be in the same hierarchy, it doesn't have to be. And there you can see my drips. And aren't they looking good? Um, obviously, they're a bit big. But the nice thing about this is that the cloner is being recognized as a spline. And the way it works is very similar to like a Photoshop brush. And a Photoshop brush is essentially a whole bunch of circles very close together. That's what it's doing here. You can almost see the ridges on them. So we can make the radius of these much smaller, say 0.4. Now you can just see we've got a few little dots. But if we increase the density, it's going to increase the number of circles. So let's set that to 1. And now we've got these drips. So we're sort of halfway there. If we get back to the beginning, press play, now we have drips just dripping from nowhere. So one of the features of MoGraph has always been that you can take animation and you can use effectors to control when it starts. It was never that intuitive. But now they've kind of changed it, and it works really well. It is, like, you can just grab an effector and pull it through, and it will drive your animation. It's something that people have wanted for ages, and it works great. So one thing you might think is that, yeah, we could just grab a linear field, and we could just drag that through and drive those drips when we want them to happen. But we can actually do it in a much better way. If I come up here and select my text object, drop that into a null, and then add in a correction deformer, just so I can keep this procedural. Um, I could make it editable, but I want to access the points of this object and also keep it with an instance. So if, I, if the producer says, hey, we're not calling it the guildy anymore, we're going to call it murder or something, then I can do it easy. Um, on here, I can, now I've got points, I can add in a uh, thing in me, what's it? A vertex, set vertex weight. So vertex maps can use fields. But if you think about it, the red is a value of 0. But when it goes yellow, it's a value of 100. OK? So this gives you an idea of how this is going to work. So come to my cloner under the Transform tab. At the moment, this is set to play. If I set this to fixed, what I can do now is I can scrub this value. And you can see that's controlling my animation. And I know that these have 50 frames. Rather than doing it here, though, we can do it with an effector. So with that selected, let's just add in a plane effector under the parameter tab. I don't want to do the position. I just want to do the time offset. So if I set that to 50 frames, now when I adjust the strength of my effector, it's going to adjust the animation. Okay, But we can drive that strength parameter by using a field. 
And we can use vertex maps as fields. So if I come back to my vertex map here, let's select that so we can see it, enable use fields, now I can grab my emitter and drop this in there. OK? And now when I press play, although the particles are hidden, you should see at some point, <laughs> oh, we can't see it because we've got all this other stuff in front. But hide that and that. And there you go. Oh, you missed it. So you can see now as the particles hit it, it's changing the values of the vertex map. They're going from 0 to 100, just like the strength of the effector. So now if we take this vertex map and we put that into our plane effector, we can use that to drive the strength. So we come to fall off, we drop this in. Now when we press play, we should see that now it drives our drips. So all I really need to do now is pull everything back together, hide this, and press play, and hopefully it works. And we've got one drip that started on its own. Look at that. <laughs> I think that's like a refresh thing. It's happened to me a few times. But it's generally, if you change it. But what's happening now is that the drips are being defined by that vertex map. So if I didn't like that, which I didn't, I can come in here and just change the random seed, and hopefully it works this time. Yeah, just. The other way of fixing it is because I think the reason it's doing that is because the, the radius of the, of the particle is too big, you see. So we can come in here, we can make the radius a little bit smaller, or alternatively, we could maybe add in like a curve. Let's just come back and see this. Because we need to see this working properly. All right, so now we do that. And then maybe if we just grab this and just crush it a bit. So we bring the yellow up, but we bring this back a bit. So it's less likely to, because the area is not so big. We need that yellow bit to be exactly where the spline sits, you know, where the axis of that spline is. OK, and then now that should, be, should give us a better result. So you can see how we can use this for creating like these fluid effects. There you go. So now we don't get any drips until we get the fluid there. And the cool thing about doing it this way is that we can easily add more drips if we want to. We can use the cloner to randomize them. Um, but if we do change the word or we change the way that the fluid effect occurs, if we'd have animated these with keyframes, we'd have had to go in and move all those keyframes around, retime it. Every time you art direct it and change it, you need to rechange those keys. With this, we could say, let's make the blood a bit bigger. Let's make it faster or whatever. And it's going to drive those drips. They're just going to automatically happen. So it's a much more flexible approach. It's much quicker. It works pretty well. And you can see that just by adding in that modifier layer, it sort of fixed that little problem we have, which is great when you get a little problem like that. And you can actually fix it in a presentation. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about was Albert Einstein. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but there's been this huge thing of like scans online. It's great. It's a really good resource. And if you, like, if you, even if you just Google scan the world, it's a really nice project where they've just kind of scanning artworks from around the world. And you can access like hundreds of different sculptures by Rodin, you know, the, the great Italian Renaissance artists. I don't even know who made this one of Einstein, but I thought, you know, it's a, it's a great way of uh, playing around with VDB as well. So we're going to just abuse Einstein a little bit here, which should be fun. So this is the mesh that we have. I'm going to just drop this into my volume builder. And you can see now we get all of our voxels. If we come in close, we can see that they're 2D. But it's, it's good because it gives you a pretty good representation of the result that you're going to get without having to have the overhead of actual geometry. If we do want geometry, of course, we can mesh it. So here we've got a volume mesher. If I just bring up my edges, you can see that's the kind of geometry that you get. So it's a pretty dense mesh. But the nice thing about vo volumes like this is that they're really fast for creating like rapid prototyping and stuff. So for example, if you wanted to create like a car wheel, like the, the actual the rim part, you could do it with a cloner, and you could create one of the spokes in a cloner, a radial cloner. And you could create a cylinder or a tube for the outside. And then you can put in a smoothing filter, and you're going to get a really nice result with, a little, with hardly any work. And then if, you wanted, if your client is like, what's it like with five spokes? What's it like with six spokes or seven spokes? You just change the count on the cloner, and you're going to get each wheel really quickly. So you can do these kind of rapid prototypes for like R&D, for client approval, et cetera. And then if, if you're not deforming it or you don't need, you just leave the mesh as it is. But if you need to like, use a rigging on it, then you just retopologize it to a nice, decent mesh. 
but it allows you the speed and efficiency of like creating those for concept work, which is brilliant. So here you can see we've got this mesh. One of the features that we have is this adaptive subdivision, which is cool. We can drag this and we can adapt the resolution of the mesh. So you can see down here in his mouth, He's got like a lot more polys, but where he's got a flat forehead, it doesn't need as much geometry. So this is really great for keeping the polygon count and the point size of your scenes much lower. Um, I'm going to just leave that as it was. Um, let's get rid of those edges. The other thing we have on here is this volume range threshold. And remember I said about the inner, inner and exterior range? This allows you to adjust to that range. So as we go all the way to the smallest point, we're like right at the very inside of the voxel range. And you can start to see the voxels appear. And the same if we go the other way. You can come back to the volume builder if you want, and you can actually adjust that in here. So you can create a bigger range if you want to erode it or dilate it more. OK, so what we're going to do first of all here is we're going to create a whole bunch of matrices over the surface. I've got a plane effector to scale them down. And on that plane effector, I'm going to add in a random field. Let's use a noise. Let's change that to stupple. I'm going to get it quite big. And the thing about this is that the noises and stuff, when you're doing this kind of stuff, is really visual. We can see that noise affecting the scale. I've got some um, animation on there. We can also add in modifier layers. So let's just add in a curve. I'm just going to pull this up just to crush it and crunch it a bit. And the effect that I'm after here is sort of like maybe bugs crawling under his skin or something. or eroding away at his face. Could be like it was a sculpture being eroded, or it could be like a horrible walking deady sort of thing. Um, and let's grab this matrix, drop it in, and he's already looking a bit peaky. Um, so what's happened now is it's taken all of these matrices from our volume, our volume builder in here, and it's, and it's meshed them all just as before. But if we chose use particle size, then it's going to remember that we've got a plane effector scaling them down. It's going to use that MoGraph data, and now we have all of these sort of horrible looking things crawling under his skin. Um, we can come back here and we could do maybe add in a linear field as well. And if you watched my presentation yesterday, I showed a whole bunch of growth techniques. Any of those would work for this. Well, I'm just going to do this with the linear field nice and quick to show. So now we can use that to kind of wipe this on. Maybe use a shader effect, a shader field with some noise to add a bit of distribution so it's not quite so linear. So now if we wanted to, instead of having these go in, we want to have a whole bunch um, sticking out like boils. We want to have a bunch that are eroding in. So we can take this matrix object, dupe it up. Let's call this one subtract. OK, and if we select our volume builder, we can select this. We can choose use particle size. We can set this to subtract. Now it's subtracting and it's eroding in. But the problem is, is that these matrices are in exactly the same place as the others. You can see, if I switch it on, then the other ones appear. So maybe what we need to do is add in another random field so we can use a different random, different noise pattern to redistribute them. But actually, because of the way fields work, it's much more efficient than that. We can take this, add a new one of these. Let's call this one subtract or whatever, sub. Drop it into here instead of this one. It's still using the same field, which is cool because we're sharing them. So we don't have to create extra ones. But even though it's using the same field, we can come here. Let's just switch that one off, switch that one there. What we could do is we maybe we just adjust the curve. Because the curve, if you think about it, where I've crushed it down, and we, we have noise. Noise is white going to black, back to white. But with, with this curve, we're saying only use like 20 to about 70%. So we're kind of crushing it down. So maybe on this one, we, we say, all right, well, we use a different range of noise. We could pull this across. Maybe we pull this one across this way, you know, something like so. Let's just grab it all and have a look. We can, like, make it bad. He's getting better, feeling good. Oh, he's coming down with it again. Um, so now we've, we've used the same noise, but we've just redistributed those values for that fall off. And now if we add both, you can see we've got the same. We've got some eating into him and some not. Pretty cool. Let's just pull that up a bit. So what we're essentially doing here, I'm going to just increase the uh, resolution of this. Let's say 0.5, just so you can see it a little bit clearer. And there you can sort of see the result that we get. You can see how fast it is at calculating this. So what we're doing here is we're using 
matrix objects and then combining those with fields to control the values. And we're using those to mesh our matrix objects with volumes. But actually, we can, we can do, we can actually use fields directly. We don't even need to include the MoGraph objects. I mean, we can if we want, because they mean they allow you to sort of paint your patterns all over it. Um, but instead of that, I'm going to show you how you can do it directly with fields. It's actually really easy. And this one is using fog rather than sign distance field. And we can still mesh fog, as you can see. Um, and the, the thing is, is when you're using fields and stuff like that, if you don't need to create booleans and complicated meshes, fog is much quicker. So if you can get away with fog, use fog. If it's faster, you use it. That's my rule. Um, and there you go. So I've dropped that in. And you can see we've got a result already. I can just set this to multiply. And now, like, look how fast it is. This is a Boolean operation. Woo, woo, choo, choo. Like, these are the kind of things we dream of with this mesh that is like pretty dense. So that's pretty cool. So these are a really great way of creating like these real-time Booleans. Um, we can do even better than that, though. And let's pull this out. And I am going to create a group field. Group fields allow you to create groups of fields. And you can create these presets almost. You can create like a whole comp as if like it's almost like a pre-comp in After Effects. You create all these effects with like your shaders, your fields, and some modifier layers. <clears throat> and then you can reuse that in lots of different places. And any changes you make to that one group field will kind of flow through everything. And it will change everything. So it's really nice and efficient. So in here, let's add in something like a random field. Let's use a noise just as before. I'm going to use stopple. I think it gives a nice look. Um, but we'll have a look at a few. And let's, let's get some animation on there as well. At the moment, it's set to max. I'm going to set it to overlay. We don't need it in the group field because we're going to reuse those. But let's just drop that group field into our volume builder. And if we set this to m multiply, we get this little cube. Now, the reason we get this little cube thing, you can see there's the noise. It's sort of working. The reason we get the cube is because a group field doesn't really have any spatial information. When I drop the spherical field in there, it's a sphere. It knows to do a sphere. A group field doesn't have any space. Um, the same with like a random field. It's like it's infinite. It goes on forever. So the creation space here is set to box. But if we choose object instead, it looks at the object underneath, and then we get this result. And you can see now we're actually using that group field with our spherical field. And we're kind of meshing that noise instantly. And it's still looking pretty fast, feeling pretty good. And you can use the same field twice as well. So if we come down here and grab that field again, this time I'm going to set this one to be max, and then subtract. And I'm so sorry, Einstein. Now he's having a bad day. Um, I'm not really sure what you'd use this for. Maybe for like, like bringing on some rock textures or something. But if you maybe, let's just try. Mod noise. Oh. Scale that down, 500, say. Now you've kind of got more of a, like a, a blocky, pixelated result, which looks pretty cool. Um, another one that works quite well, Voronoi is good. And like, scale that up a bit, maybe, 1,000. Now you're sort of thinking like chocolate or something, you know? Um, we grab this spherical field. You can see we can move that around still, getting a pretty good result. We can adjust our fall off here. And if we want, we can also use our mesher, and we can adjust the actual threshold here. And because when I push that out, you can see that we end up with a sphere shape. That's because I'm using the spherical field. But if we were using another object, for instance, then you could use this as a, like a kind of transition between shapes. There's all sorts of things you can do. And you can see how much fun it is. And you can waste hours of time doing this. It's great. So. In this example, we're actually using the fields directly in the OpenVDB. But just remember that the OpenVDB voxels are just something that has a value between 0 to 1. And when you add in a random field, it's just kind of values that are saying, make this 0, make this 1, and all the in-betweens. And then when you adjust your volume measure, you're saying which threshold, at what point, do we actually mesh that voxel, when it's 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 or 0 0.7. So it's really simple the way that it works, but it allows you to achieve really fast and impressive results. Um, so I thought we'd give Einstein a break, show you something else with meshing noise. This is the kind of thing that you're going to see over Instagram everywhere. Um, <clears throat>
but it's fun and it's cool and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a great way to learn the tools. And I think as people learn these new tools over the next six to 12 months, people are just going to start doing some incredibly complicated, amazing things with them. So in this example, I've got an instance for my head, which means that I can change that referenced object nice and easily. So I can build this setup, save it out, and then I just swap the object in the instance and it will update on all of my models. I'm going to mesh this using my volume mesher. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, once again, I'm going to come up and create a group field. Now, we could add a random field directly in here, but what I want to do is I want to use a group field because you can use it as well as for grouping lots of different fields. You can use it for um, using like non object fields. So, for exam example, the random field, the spherical field, etc., all of these fields are objects that appear in your object manager. So, you can just drop those straight into your volume. But things like, oh, sorry, these modifier layers, you can't put those in. So if I put a random field into my volume builder, I can't then colorize it or use curves on it. But if you use a group field, then you can. So it's like another way of using the group field. So it's a really great idea that it's designed like that. So let's just choose a noise. Leave it as Perlin noise for now. Set that, say, 250. We can add some animation to this. And you get this preview, which is nice. So we can see what it's going to look like. Oh, and you can switch that off as well. So now we've got a random field in there. Let's drop this group field into our volume builder. We're going to have the same problem as before. So we set this to object. OK, and we set this to multiply. And now you can see we're getting this. And uh, me and Lorcan were talking about yesterday, we we're going to do 36 days of cheese <laughs> rather than 36 days of type. Um, so there's my Swiss cheese example. And of course, we can add in these filters, smoothing layer. The reshape layer allows you to erode and dilate. By the way, you can also add these up here as objects if you want to use them in more than one place, because it allows you to globally change it. Um, I don't worry about that for now. I'm just going to add in a smooth layer. OK. We could set that voxel distance to 1, maybe. So that noise has got values between 0 and 1. And depending on what it is in 3D space, depends on whether that voxel gets meshed. So coming back to our group layer, what we could essentially do here is what we did before, is we can add in a curve. And if I set this to be a, a linear curve, add in a, let's add a point and pull this up, pull this down. So now what I'm doing is I'm saying only mesh the values or only use these values to, in your voxels between naught going up here to 0.2 and back down to 0.4. And if I grab this whole point thing, I can like pull it across and just change the range of values that I'm including. So imagine I just want to do it like this. But the cool thing about this approach is now if I come up and grab my volume measure, I can change it. Let's give it a different color material so we can see it. I can come into my group field and I can change the, whoops. I can change the range. You see now I've got the two different values and they're kind of meshing together, you know. So I could do this again. Let's make this one green. You can see the difference. And again, we've got this group field. We can pull this one right across. OK, and you can see there are our various meshes. So now we've got these three noise. There's got one noise type, but we've meshed it three different ways by accessing those different value ranges. Now we've got that set up, we can use our threshold to sort of change how much of that we might want to see. If we don't want them to overlap and intersect, we can kind of shrink some of them, you know? So you can create these crazy effects. They're really cool. Um, and because we've done it all using our group field as well, we've kept it really easy to adjust. So I could come to my random field, and I'll say, all right, maybe let's use mod noise. Maybe make it like 100. So we get this sort of cubic head, you know? Um, it probably looks better a bit bigger. And, and because we're using this, low, this large voxel size, everything's happening nice and quick. So we can get a rough idea of what's going on. But when we actually take these objects and we just say we make this one or something, so we're going to have a lot more voxels, it takes a bit longer to calculate. But now you can see we get a lot more of an accurate result. And you can see that this would be perhaps a little bit more useful, like heads up display or something like that. Or you could do type with it. I've just done a head. You can do any object you want. Um, and again, like, uh, sorry, coming back to my random field, you can just experiment with different noises. And Voronoi, again, looks pretty good. 
Let's change that. Let's make it even finer. 0 0.75, 0 0.8. You can see down here it's calculating for the volume. There you go, now we've got that result, which is pretty rad. Um, yeah, if I just come back to here, I've got some examples of that sort of stuff. So like now you can create this kind of thing. This is the same as, it's pretty much exactly the same as I just showed you. These are all rendered with Redshift as well. Redshift is available, but no, I don't think it's available yet, but nor is R20. But Redshift, the developers have got it ready for R20. It works with all the new stuff, volumes, multi-instances. So it's pretty cool. So the next thing I wanted to show you is this one. This is a very similar kind of approach. And this is kind of like using, vo using formulas to uh, control your voxels. Again, with just a simple head. But it's when you like, realize how this stuff works, and then you think there's just such an infinite number of possibilities, you can create all sorts of mad effects that clients are just going to love. So if we come back to cinema, once again, a very similar setup where we've got a, an instance, so that when I create m multiple volumes, I can easily replace my object. I've got a volume builder, volume mesher. So if I add this in, OK, there's my volume. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, just create. You could do this with a group field as before, and then you could use that to alter the values as well. Um, but I'm just going to use a formula field. Now, don't get me wrong, honestly. This stuff down here, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what that means. So I just like play with it, change things. Add pi in there, or change sin to tan, or something. or or like, ask someone clever. Anyway, so if we drop this in, you can think about you can like you can you can think about what it's sort of doing. If I select my volume builder, now my formula field, you see again it doesn't have a shape, so it's kind of creating this box. But we can use objects. All right. So now what's happening? If we look at the formula field, it's doing some weird things. But each voxel just has a value, so it's changing that value based on this formula. So it's taking 0.5, it's adding sine, and I know sine is this thing that does this. So imagine naught is in the middle, it's going like 1, minus 1 or something, or it might be going, anyway, might be just going naught to 1 and back. And then it's looking at subfields, and subfields are amazing. And then it's looking at the ID and the count, and it's like, what are all these different variables? Well, we can fold it down, we can see them here. So ID is the component index. So if you were using a formula deformer, that would be the the point of the object, it would be the vertex. If you're using a formula effector, that would be the clone, the number of the clone. Because we're using a voxel, it's the number of the voxel. So it, it means it's going to iterate through every single voxel really fast. And it's going to then do that for the whole count, which is, means the number of them. Um, it's then going to add time. So we've got this D, which is delta time, and then times it by frequency, which is how fast it does it. So essentially, it's just doing this sign thing to all of the voxels. And you get this sort of result. So it's like, now what you need is you need someone like a really good TD in your studio who can go, try this formula. Or you can go online. There's loads of different formula websites, and you can just try them all out. Or you can just change this one. So I'm thinking, rather than using the ID in the count, what happens if I just remove this part? Whoops. I've just ejected the drive. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but hopefully they didn't want it. Um, OK. And now it's not doing anything. You notice that it's looking a bit blocky as well. I think if we set this to multiply, it's going to look better. There you go. Um, now it's not doing anything. But that formula is still doing something because it's got this subfields parameter in there. So some of the fields allow you to use fields in them which seems a bit crazy. But it means that you can like attenuate or control the strength of that field with another field. So it's pretty cool. It means if you added like a linear field in here, you could use it so that you made a gradient so your voxels at the top would be doing the signy thing, and then at some point it would stop. Um, and you can use them with regular MoGraph as well. So the subfields in here allow you to add something else in. So what I've got here is I have this matrix object. OK, I'm actually going to change that to be object, drag in this head. All right, let's say about 200 of these, maybe. So now I've got all of these on the head. 
And I'm going to say, all right, use that as my subfield. And what it's going to do is it's going to take that point and it's going to put the formula around it. So each point is going to have that sine wave effect. This is where it starts to get fun. So I come here and I drag my matrix in, point object, and you can see there we go. So now we've got a result. And now if we scrub through, you can see it's starting to look pretty mad. And of course, we can come to our matrix and we can like adjust the radius of this. Hello. Whoop. Um, so you can see you can do some pretty dope stuff. We can come back to our volume measure, of course. We've got this we can use. Um, I think in here, what I'm going to do is set this to use. Oh, no, I'm not. That's something else. Ignore me. If we come back to my formula field, OK. Let's reduce that down. This is set to multiply, OK. So let's just dupe it. I'll make this a different color. Whereas before, we were like using the curves to crush the values. This time, I'm just going to use blending modes. So in my volume builder here, I can just set this one to subtract, OK? And can't see the material for some reason. Oh, I don't know. Oh, well. Now we've got two things going on there, looking pretty mad. Let's come in here, change this, maybe set this down to 1.25. OK, um, and maybe in my formula, Increase this. I don't know, you see, this is where I like I wish I knew what I was doing. <laughs> 70 to 720. So now it's going to do it twice as many times. I'm not sure why we're not getting the different colours here actually. Let's just delete that and that. Let's do it here. Oh, it's because that's set to on. Look. Wah, wah. User error. Um yeah, so now we can adjust this. There we go, that's what I'm talking about. Gets there in the end. And now you can see we've got that kind of result that I showed before. And that's just by putting those matrices on the surface. If we add like a random effector so they move around, then it's going to do something weird. If you start firing particles through, it's going to do it. Or you could draw splines and it will do it with a spline. Or you could do like all of those things together. You could do like some really cool MoGraph thing with like effectors and, and then use that as to control your formula. You know, so the the possibilities are infinite. Um, probably can't scrub this because I've set the voxel size a bit small, but you can see it calculates pretty quickly, and that that's how you can create those kind of crazy things. So yeah, so as you can see, <laughs> I'm no mathematician, but you can see that like this is great fun. This really is, and you can have so much fun with it, and like eventually. Like, we're going to take these ideas and take them even further and do some amazing work for our clients. So thank you, Maxon, for implementing this stuff. It's awesome. <clears throat> thank you. I haven't finished yet. Almost. So um, I've got to do the hard sell, man. Buy my training. So all the stuff that I covered yesterday and today, I have some new training out. I've only spent 50, 49 minutes, 18 seconds today, and I've obviously blethered on about all sorts of stuff. My training is seven hours, just under. You can get it on a special, or I think it's going to be 99 bucks, but it's on for like 79 at the moment, um, from hollolux.com. And this is a little promo video of all these sort of techniques, and you learn all of this stuff in my training. Everything I've covered, I'll go into in a lot more depth, plus a lot more. So yeah, hellolux.com, check it out. And I know R20 is not out yet, but it means you're going to be up to speed. And when you do get it, you'll be like, I know how to do this already. Um, so yeah, hellolux.com, please visit. Anyway, if you don't want to buy it, just go and do some of the free tutorials. There's some great stuff. Um, this is my Twitter, if you want to follow me. Thank you very much. <laughs>